Chapter 2, Part 2 Philosophy and Spirituality 2.4 The Hellenistic Spiritual, the Platonic and the Christian Models Foucault analyzes the spiritual practices of antiquity in their different forms and manifestations, discerning two major formations of spiritual practices in the Western world. Quote, Eros and Ascesis are, I think, the two major forms in Western spirituality for conceptualizing the modalities by which the subject must be transformed in order to finally become capable of truth. Foucault. We have already covered the question of the relation between this truth and transformation in the ancient art of the self. Looking at spiritual practices from the point of view of subjectivity, what is peculiar about these practices of Eros, Ascesis, and all their variations is that through them the subject actively constitutes itself. It is a form of constitution to be found in the Hellenistic model of an art of transformation, which is quite unlike the other two forms of constitution of the self. Foucault points out that he uses the term Hellenistic model here merely for reasons of convenience to distinguish it from the Platonic and the Christian model. He proceeds to analyze this Hellenistic model in great detail, using amongst others sources from the Epicurean, Cynic and Stoic philosophers. It remains the lasting achievement of Plato to have uncovered this Hellenistic model consisting in the interplay between the care of the self and the knowledge of the self, in his Alcibiades. However, Plato here plays a double game. On the one hand, he uncovers and formulates those two principles of the previous Greek antiquity, but at the same time, he covers the space so cleared once more by making one of those principles predominant and downplaying the other. Plato famously places the stress on the knowledge of the self and links this to the quest of finding out the truth about oneself. For finding out this truth, the human being needs to look inside itself, towards its soul. Before birth, the soul lives in the world of the senses, but at birth, it forgets what it has seen before. With Plato, knowing oneself thus has the meaning of a cognitive recollection, an act of memory, in which the soul remembers the world of the senses, and thus becomes aware of the truth, which is also the truth of itself in its very own being. In the dialogue between Socrates and Alcibiades, Plato recurs to the care of the self, but absorbs the principle of spirituality into the philosophic precept of knowing oneself through an act of recollection. However, while the spiritual practice still plays a certain role with Plato, already with the Neoplatonists, Knowledge becomes the sole principle for accessing the truth. The accumulation of knowledge according to abstract and formal criteria is now all there is to truth. With that, we have entered the realm of the modern understanding of truth. Quote, I think the modern age of the history of truth begins when knowledge itself and knowledge alone gives access to truth. That is to say, it is when the philosopher or scientist or simply someone who seeks the truth can recognize the truth and have access to it in himself and solely through his activity of knowing without anything else being demanded of him and without having to change or alter his being as subject. Foucault. The rebound effect of truth on the self and thus the transformation of the self become so impossible. Truth in this instance becomes the Apollonian category as which we have analyzed it in a previous chapter. 
it loses its relational, local, and personal, and transrational character. Much to the contrary, this absolute and universal truth now turns into the epitome and cornerstone of a rational description of world and self. But there is a price to be paid, as the transfiguration, salvation, and transformation that was possible in the Hellenistic model has become impossible. The modern relation between the truth and the self have begun. Foucault asserts, when it is postulated that such as he is, the subject is capable of truth, but that such as it is, the truth cannot save the subject. Following the rigid methodologies of science, truth is accessible for all, but that truth quite simply can do nothing for us. From this Cartesian moment onwards, the history of truth is a history of knowledge which leaves the subject untouched. Quote, knowledge will simply open unto the indefinite dimensions of progress, the end of which is unknown and the advantage of which will only ever be realized in the course of history by the institutional accumulation of bodies of knowledge or the psychological social benefits to be had from having discovered the truth after having taken such pains to do so. Foucault. And so it follows that a crucial moment in Western history is reached when Descartes succeeds in substituting a subject as founder of practices of knowledge for a subject constituted through practices of the self. The accumulation of knowledge in this new world so has superseded the transformation of the self that was practiced in the old one. Foucault portrays Goethe's Faust as being on the borderline between the old and the new world. Faust so represents a figure really belonging to neither one because he lives in the new and scientific world but still realizes what already has been lost with the old spiritual one. After having studied the traditional disciplines, philosophy, medicine, theology, and law, after having painstakingly followed the formalistic requirements down to the last detail and after having acquired their knowledge, Faust demands transformation and wants to be transfigured and saved. But trying to read the formal scientific text in a spiritual way can only fail, leaving him the now proverbial poor fool, no wiser than before, and ultimately driving him into the pact with the devil as substitute for the spirituality to which he no longer has access. Only a few centuries later, the West has for the most part also already forgotten what has been lost. Here we have, in an admittedly a very abridged version, the history of the Platonic model, which should prove to become such an epoch-making venture in the West and move from the soul searching for the truth to a fully externalized and abstracted truth to be found by applying the methods of rational science to an objective outside world. Returning once more to the original Platonic model, we find that unlike the Hellenistic model, it applies a method of an, of an internal gaze in an act of recollection. Like the Hellenistic model, the original Platonic model so still knows a truth that needs to be accessed positively. But while the Hellenistic model works from an understanding of a subjectivity that is to be actively constituted, the self as a permanent and unfinished work in progress, and thus knows no essence to which to return, the Platonic model consists in the search for the innermost kernel of truth that is the essence of the human being in the soul. Most importantly, the Platonic model also gives precedence to the knowledge of the self, the philosophical or Apollonian elements, 
While confining the care of the self, the spiritual or Dionysian, to the margins. Lastly, as we already have established, the figure of truth works completely different in both these models. In Plato, it is the pre-given absolute truth which is to be found or remembered. In the Hellenistic model, it is the relative, local, and personalized truth which cannot be expressed rationally. The third great and historically youngest model, the Christian one, will take on some elements of both the Hellenistic and the Platonic ones, but will put them to new uses. Foucault describes this Christian model alternatively as the model of an exegesis of the self and as the self-renunciatory model. Like in the Platonic model, its understanding of truth is an absolute one, and also like the former, it admonishes the subject to turn inwards. However, in the Christian model, this turn inwards serves to test all of one's own thoughts and emotions in order to find out whether there is sin, evil, or concupiscence lurking inside oneself. Everything that comes from the inside has to be mistrusted, painstakingly examined and scrutinized to ascertain that it is not Satan whispering his insinuations through our seemingly pure feelings and thoughts. Like the Hellenistic, the Christian model also couples this knowledge of the self with a certain set of practices. A series of tests, exercises, and purifications, the most famous of which would be the confession. Unlike both the Hellenistic and the Platonic model, however, the ultimate aim of the Christian model is neither recollecting the fullness of one's soul, nor is it the transformation, but on the contrary, renunciation. The aim of knowledge of the self in the Christian model is to decipher oneself. What is found is to be confessed, renounced, and purged. Quote, Each person has the duty to know who he is, that is, to try to know what is happening inside him, to acknowledge faults, to recognize temptations, to locate desires. And everyone is obliged to disclose these things either to God or to others in the community, and ends to bear public or private witness against oneself. Foucault. The ultimate renunciation within the Christian model would be, of course, the complete renunciation of the self, and with it the rejection of everything mundane in favor of hastening all the faster and purer along the road to the heavenly kingdom. Although they both share the concept of a combination of knowledge and practice, the affirmation of the Hellenistic model is so contrasted with the renunciation of the Christian model. This certain closeness in methods under diametrically opposed goals is shown by Foucault on the example of the practice of ascesis or ascesis in the Christian version. The practice of ascesis or ascesis plays an important role in both traditions. In the Hellenistic model, ascesis is used as a means of actively fashioning the self, as a way of constituting oneself and attaining a full, perfect and complete relationship of oneself to oneself. The moments of austerity are so employed as a means to obtain a fuller and more inclusive relation to oneself. The Christian use of ascesis, however, goes the exact opposite way and leads through a series of abstentions and renunciations of the flesh to the essential renunciation, self-renunciation. The Christian ascesis ultimately does not lead to an affirmation but to a negation of the self, of its body, and its being constituted in the world. It is in this second meaning that the term ascesis has survived, which is used in the modern Western common language, ascesis as renunciation and abstention.
but which is quite different from the historically older Hellenistic understanding of Ascasis. It is also not coincidentally that the second major form of antique practices, eros, the practice and art of love, received a radical redefinition and was re-employed in the Christian model. Love is then stripped from all its physical, all its erotic components, as well as from its relational focus on the world here and now. Sexuality, the bodily act, is suppressed in favor of a singular and burning love of God. The practice of this love so does not manifest in a transforming and transfiguring art of pleasure, but through the vows of celibacy in which the earthly is denied, the desires and pleasures of the self have to be renounced and rejected and turned into an exclusive focus on God. 2.5. Beyond the Greek Example In the course of history, through a series of conversions, change, shifts and breaks, Foucault asserts the Hellenistic model was buried and hidden beneath the Platonic and Christian models, whose tradition goes up until modernity and whose influence lasts until today. All three of them share some similarities, however, there is just as much that separates them as there are commonalities. The Christian model probably still is the clearest and easiest to single out today. But the influence of the historic successors of the Platonic model, Cartesian method, the sciences, law, and indeed philosophy, are nowadays just as prevalent and powerful. And yet, or perhaps rather because of this, the question of a style of living, of a certain aesthetic of existence, which is not bound by the Apollonian universalisms of science and law, still looms large today. Quote, if you take, for example, Stirner, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Dandyism, Baudelaire, Anarchy, Anarchist thought, etc., then you have a series of attempts that are, of course, very different from each other, but which are all more or less obsessed with the question, is it possible to constitute or reconstitute an aesthetics of the self? Foucault. Such an aesthetics, I will argue, in what is to follow, might become possible if seen in conjunction with an energetic principle, without taking into account the Dionysian. Any aesthetics of existence will, iniv will invariably be thrown back on its pure Apollonian foundations. But an inclusion of the Dionysian can only to a certain point be achieved by theoretical and cognitive means. Since theory in academia, as well as science in its broadest understanding, are themselves results of the rational Apollonian hegemony, there is a limit to their use value and a threshold for their explicative power. The direction we are headed towards an art of the transpersonal self might serve to show exactly those limitations. Furthermore, if the Dionysian is to be respected, those limits have to be recognized, as any attempt to theorize the Dionysian will lead back to the rational field of the Apollonian. The difficulty for anybody brought up in the West and schooled cognitively in the social sciences consists in exactly resisting this urge to rationalize and theorize, ultimately converting the words of Wolfgang Schirmacher, theory is not life, its time and movements are not ours, in it we won't be saved or transfigured, the good life finally remains elusive and not amenable to the means of theory. If the problem is still our own transformation, then this will not occur in and through theory. It might occur in the coupling of the Apollonian and the Dionysian. But also these very words and lines here are ultimately only the attaching of labels to, and thus reductions of the 
X, that which cannot be known, only understood and therefore has to be named and thus reduced if one is to find any way of even a verbal approximation. Just as this coupling cannot be grasped cognitively, it can so also not be willed, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we learn and know, no matter how hard we push, we will not be able to force a transformation of ourselves. This, finally, is another meaning of the claim made before, that the transformation of the self can only occur via embracing uncertainty and risk. Only by an act of defocusing of our cognitive mind, of letting go that which we have willed so hard to manifest, might we finally become able to make that jump or open that line of flight and deterritorialize the words and as of yet unknown becoming. It is not enough to dare to know, for what is of even greater importance is to dare to let go of knowledge, not from a position of ignorance, but in order to open a window of possibility towards that which the own knowledge has blocked us from, basking in the radiance of the Apollonian sun also blinds. With Nietzsche, one can point to the limits of knowledge when eating his assertion that what he wants is once and for all not to know many things. Wisdom sets limits to knowledge too, Nietzsche. No amount of deconstruction, necessary and valid as it may be, will by itself be able to make that one twisting, verwinden, den, step further, only by giving those rational elements of critique their time and place, but finally distorting them in an experiential field, might this step finally occur. What emerges, going with Michel Foucault and Friedrich Nietzsche beyond these authors, might be an art of the transpersonal self, which is formed in the interplay of an aesthetic and energetic practice. From this follows already a necessity for the next chapters, because everything that has been sketched so far still could be interpreted along the lines of a clear-cut individual subjectivity, along the lines of an eye that establishes itself in an aesthetic practice against an other. Indeed, it is not yet sufficiently clear in how far this emergent practice of the self exactly would be different from the man-makes history of modernity, which in this rendering might be misguidedly spelled out as man-makes himself. I will thus, in the next two steps, recast in greater detail the Dionysian figure of the energetic and trace the interplay between aesthetic and energetic until the point where individuality blurs and transpersonality sets in. This transpersonal sphere, if such a sphere can be conceptualized at all, will have to be charted time and again, redrawn, drafted and redrafted. It may contain familiar elements, but in new and different places. This sphere of transpersonality might so become a local and contingent space, containing shifting parts, boundings and openings, as well as aesthetic energetic lines in an ever-morphing matrix beyond the clear self and other. Before reaching this point, however, some further preliminary moves towards an understanding of the elements involved here, especially the notions of art, transformation, and self-subjectivity will be necessary. I will begin with the last one for the remainder of this chapter and continue with notions of art and transformation as main themes in the next one. 2.6. Subjectivity and self. Before proceeding any further, what remains to be done is disentangle and clarify the concepts of self and subject in this Foucauldian rendering. In this respect, the difference between the Platonic and the Christian models, on the one hand, 
and the Hellenistic model, on the other end, is once more crucial. Foucault first distinguishes the Hellenistic self from essential accounts, which build subjectivity on top of a pre-given, unwavering self as soul as corresponding to both the Platonic model and the Christian model. In both of those, subjectivation is something that happens on top of this pre-given, stable self as essence. In each of those instances, the concrete subject in its outward appearances is built upon an inner self which forms its permanent and eternal truth. Foucault casts the Cartesian eye to be of a similar mold, as the stable, essential ground from which all further thinking and becoming can derive. Both the Christian and the Platonic model so introduce a difference between a transcendent self and a concrete subject, which is built upon it and forms its outward appearance. Where those two models differ is in the subsequent consequences and technologies of subjectivation. As stated previously, the defining feature of the Platonic model here is recollection, or memory, and the one of the Christian model is renunciation. Historically, those two models have become dominant. What Foucault attempts to distinguish from both those essentialist accounts is the Hellenistic model, which follows an utterly constructivist concept. Taking away the idea of a pre-given essence, the concepts of subjectivity and self are treated as synonymous in this Hellenistic model, which Foucault ultimately follows. The self and the subject are identical, because a distinction between a pre-given human essence, a transcendent soul or self, and something that is merely constructed afterwards, subjectivity and subjectivation, no longer exists. The history of the self-subject for Foucault only begins at the moment when the human being starts applying the technologies of relationality, not just to the outside world and to its fellow humans, but to itself, in order to fashion the own subjectivity, in order to become different. Put in other words, in Foucault's historical rendering, the human subject enters the scene once the human animal starts creating itself, starts creating its self. What Gilles Deleuze's masterful description of this Foucauldian process shows is that for Foucault, the Greeks invented the subject, but only as a derivative or a product of a subjectivation. In this understanding, subjectivation as the art of creating oneself comes first, and the subject, self, is only the after-effect of the process. It is a thought very similar to the one already put forth by Wolfgang Schirmacher, who asserts that the defining feature of humanity, what makes us human, is technology as exemplified in the process of creating oneself through the tools we use. In his rendering, Foucault inverts both the Platonic and the Christian model, which first pulls a transcendent self to which afterwards the merely mundane technologies of subjectivation could be applied. For Foucault, however, there is no transcendent self or stable I upon which to build subjectivity. The self and the subject are the same, a form shaped and reshaped in the flow of a never-ending process. The very interiority or inside of the human being is therefore also nothing pre-given, but needs to be created. Interiority derives from the process of subjectivation. Only by folding the outside, by bending the relations with the external world back, and by applying the technologies of relationality to the human animal, does the self arise. The inside so derives from the folding of the outside, and only thus is the space created in which the self-subjectivity shall be built. Quote, 
It is as if the relations of the outside folded back to create a doubling, allow a relation to oneself to emerge, and constitute an inside which is hollowed out and develops in its own unique dimension. What the Greeks did is not to reveal being or unfold the open in a world historical gesture. According to Foucault, they did a great deal less or more. They bent the outside through a series of practical exercises. The Greeks are the first at doubling. Deleuze. Subjectivation, Deleuze concludes, is created by folding. This adds another aspect to the idea of the self as form, which is created in relationality. The process of folding the outside creates the inside, which gives the self its shape. The human subject is that which is relational in all directions. One, relating towards the non-human environment, relating to nature or to the divine world. Two, relating towards fellow human beings. And three, relating to oneself. The subject thus arises as embedded in this triple relationality. It is the last aspect of this triad, the relation to oneself, which according to Foucault was only completed in ancient Greek times and which will be the focus of the study towards an art of the self. Subjectivation can then also be understood as an active practice, as the process of becoming by which the subject self continues to create itself in a perpetual movement of transforming itself and changing nature. Now, while one might debate whether placing the invention of technologies of self-creation with the Greeks is historically accurate, what needs to be highlighted here is the concept of self that is not distinguished from the concept of subjectivity along a transcendent immanent line, but that uses both synonymously as something arising in a procedural manner and open to aesthetic, energetic practices of transformation. 2.7 Conclusion Several critical insights have been established in this Foucauldian chapter. First, we approached, in a second transposition, how the Greeks concretely operationalized the interplay between the Dionysian and Apollonian in the form of the art of the self, rendered by Michel Foucault via the spiritual and philosophical principle. Taking the findings of the first chapter, it became possible through this transposition to relate the Apollonian Dionysian to the mutual conditioning of the knowledge of the self philosophy, and care of the self, spirituality. Secondly, complemented with the Nietzschean general view of the first chapter, has so been complemented with a more concrete view on subjectivation in the second. There, thirdly, is now a necessity for the third and fourth chapters to deal with a constructive concern. In how far does this art of the self differ from the self-grounding autonomous high of modernity. Fourthly, the necessary and very cursory historical overview is now largely completed, and once again with Foucault, it has been established how the art of living of the Hellenistic model was historically supplanted by the combination of the Platonic and the Christian model. These explications echoed those of the first chapter, but served to further the understanding of what we are facing now in postmodern times. Fifthly, the transrational was approached once more by pointing to the critical limitations of postmodern and ultimately any theorizing. Here one encounters the limits of rationality and of any critique of rationality by rational means. Together with the findings of the first chapter, one can so once more reassert the importance of an experiential field of understanding beyond knowing and knowledge. Sixthly, this led to the insight that any art of the self that wants to be more than either just an imitation of antiquity or yet again a reduction to the Apollonian aesthetics 
we'll have to find different venues, the verving dum, of, within and through postmodernity. Different practices to recon for the energetic will have to be found, for a mere repetition of Greek times seems to be neither feasible nor desired. Here another crucial problem for the next chapters is encountered. What concrete practices can there be found in today's world that might be useful to a new art of the self, which is simultaneously transrational and transpersonal? What approaches can be found that take the Dionysian into account and resist the pull of the pure rational mind that has become so hegemonic in the West? Because it is quite clear that although we cannot turn back the time, but neither might we want to live forever under the rays of this Apollonian sun, lest we get burnt to a mere dry, formal, aesthetic husks.